Are you live. Me? I'm live. Hey, um, is everything good? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me now? Okay, we have to put our volumes down if we're going to play. Um, so my question is, can you see me? Can you hear me? And can you guys? Yeah, we'll look. Yep, you're, we can see you. I don't know if we can hear you, but I'm sure people will let us know. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A, B, C, D. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. So we've got audio, we got video. Greetings all. Um, it is 430. I'm looking at the clock. So um, same kind of a drill. Hi, I'm Darren with My RV Works. Um, we are in Trisha and Sid's home. Um, and uh, we're doing our live stream in her living room. And um, um, so I've got Ann and Trisha with me here, just like last time. And I'm excited to get some of your questions answered. Um, do we want to go over any uh, housekeeping? Yeah. Um, first, you want to do some shout outs. We've got some people saying hi. Okay. So hi, Eric and Joe and Jeff. And oh, the RV Goalie Life. I recognize that name. I'm not sure why, but I recognize it. Okay. Um, John, Stacy, Earl, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. So I think just tell them like we're going to go over, answer questions. People are already putting in their questions. So we already got a good, oh, good. A good start on I could, that. We've got some. Okay. Um, free questions here to go. I'll just jump through these real quick. Um, so one of the first questions, we we had this question come through uh, earlier in the week, I believe. Um, now, on a little side note, uh, earlier this week I was sick, um, so my voice is kind of scratchy. I'm not contagious anymore, but um, my voice is kind of weird, so I'm sure it'll be fine. I got some water with me, but that's what's going on with, with Darren. Um, so the first question was uh, involving um, LP uh, uh, bench testing, and um, um, they, they're, they're RV technician and they put together a propane adapter for bench testing. Do we make something? And we most certainly do. And so if you go to our website, myrvaworks.com and you click on the tools that Darren makes, you're going to see tools that look like this. Um, these little things like this, and I've got all these others. So I have 11 different variants of these things. For me, they hang them from the tree, right? And um, so every one of these things um, can be used to tap into LP and do it on a bench test. I've made two different types. Some of these are what I call standalone, where this right here would be one that you would tap into a regulator. It's a standalone product. Um, and then the other version that I make are these quick connect. So you buy the manifold and then you basically, uh, this would tap into a 3 8 this would tap into a stove bud, this would tap directly into a gas valve. So um, it's all on our website. Um, uh, go to the tools that we make and you'll see the LP tap jigs there. So there's that. And I think we're gonna do a live, we're gonna try to do a live stream in a couple of weeks to talk more about our tools so that um, questions can be answered on there. I did wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. So at the end of this, <laughs> Trisha's talking there. Uh, She's going to. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can put your questions in the live chat and we'll pick them and answer them. We're going to do an hour here. So 4.30 to 5.30. At the end of that, we're going to do a giveaway. Um, so if you want to enter in, some of you have already done it, but your location, um, if you want to enter into that drawing, we'll be giving away a gift basket. At the end of this, we'll pick a winner. Um, so just in the... Um, in the live chat, just put your location to enter in um, for that. We're going to be doing some polls throughout this time, so we um, you'll see those pop up. So feel free to interact with us um, that way. And um, and then at the end, um, we're going to switch over to Patreon. So we'll go 4.30 to 5.30 here on YouTube. And then if you are a patron, go ahead and hop on over there. We're going to do um, what we call overtime. And we'll answer some more questions there for about a half an hour. Um, we'll give a link if you want to join Patreon, um, support us over there and, and hop over there and we can answer your questions as well. I think that's it. That's oh. your second question. All right. There's some housekeeping for you guys. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna just I'm gonna just start plugging these questions here real quick. We have another pre-pre-question uh, question, and it involves a Lippert slide room. And um, basically he's getting a code every time the slide room is moving. And um, it's saying haul short to ground. He's changed some wires around. And in one of my videos, I mentioned, you know, like clear the fault and then run it again. And he's like, how do you clear the fault? 
Well, the way you clear the fault is just run the room again. Um, it doesn't remember the last. Um, so the slide room will fault and then you will um, you could read the, the green and red blinky lights and read what that means. And then as soon as you run the room again, like in other words, if you were going out and the thing faulted, then the next time you push a button to come in, it will clear the fault. So that's how you clear the fault under Swintec. All right. So those are done with the pre-questions. You got some housekeeping done. We got some merch we're going to be giving away at the end. And then at the very end, we're going to jump over to Patreon for an additional half hour. So um, let's go with some questions. Okay. So <clears throat> Joe says he has a weird problem. A weird problem. The RV pump continues to cycle, but will stop once the hot water, once the water is hot. Doesn't matter if it's on gas or electric. Once the hot water is hot, the pump stops. Oh, fastening. Okay, so you have a water heater that when the, okay, so it, you have a water pump that's running, 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 and then you have a water heater, and when the water heater is heating, the pump is running, but as soon as the water heater stops heating, the pump stops. I just asked if that's, yeah. Is, is that correct. correct? So, Joe, if you want to give us some feedback, I'll look and see. Um. So the question then becomes, what, what does the water pump and the water heater have to do with each other? I know on some water heaters, there's a check valve that is on the... So one thing, I'm just going to rattle off a couple of things to think of, and then we'll keep on moving. So a couple of things to check. A, make sure that you can gain access to the back of your water heater and make sure that it's not in bypass mode. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, you know, um, and uh, make sure it's not in bypass mode, that the cold water is going into the water heater and the hot water is coming out of the water heater and it can't bypass on not every single water heater, but on quite a few of them, they will put a check valve on the hot outfeed side of the water heater. So you wanna make sure that your check valve is not fouled out. Um, but see, that's only if the water's running and yours is only heating. That's a weird one. Um, if you would like to um, send me an email with a little bit more information, maybe some. So I would love to dive into this. This is this is like the kind of riddles I really enjoy doing, but I do need more information. Um, so right out of the gate, I would just look for those two things. What do they have to do with the water pump? I have no idea, um, but it is interesting. That's a, that's a fascinating one. So what I would say to that is, is send me an email, info at myriverworks.com with more information, and I'm more than happy to kind of go back and forth and answer some questions maybe and see if we can't figure out what's going on there because okay. I am kind of curious myself. He's going to say he's going to do it. He says only after the water gets hot does it stop. That um, is so weird. So Joe mentioned when you emailed, <clears throat> mentioned that um, it's from this live stream. So I know not to give you the blurb that we can't answer questions yeah. one on one. <laughs> yeah. So Trisha will be the gatekeeper on that. <laughs> so yeah, make sure that you um, um, mentioned that this was the follow up question from the live stream. And then Restoring Reality says the exterior molding is pulling away from the corners of some windows. Will this cause a leak? Should it be caulked or replaced? What do I need to do, if anything? The first thing I would want on that is maybe a picture. Um, because on some of those windows, they do have a metal flange on the window. So then you would put some butyl tape or like a double-sided foam tape. And that gets pressed into the side of the RV. Um, it depends on if it's a fiberglass side or the stick and tin that's kind of, um, you know, profiled. Um, so if it's just an edge trimming just for decoration, that should that in itself should not cause a leak. Um, so that's where a picture would be handy to know exactly what we're looking at. So if it's decorative trim, I don't think it's going to cause a leak. But if it's the actual window pulling away from the side of the RV, yes, that would cause a leak. Okay. I'm trying to go faster because I think I was reviewing my last live stream and I spent way too much time on, on some of the questions and I wasn't able to get to as many. So you might notice I'm trying to get through them quicker to get through more questions. Okay. So hopefully I can appreciate that. <laughs> so Ralph says, are control boards interchangeable between different suburban models, different BTU ratings? 
Yes, they are. Um, because basically you're looking at this, these boards are DSI, direct spark ignition boards. I'm a huge fan of Dinosaur. Sorry, Suburban. Sorry, Dometic. I love you guys too. But Dinosaur makes a fantastic board. They come with a three-year warranty. And a lot of their boards are uh, like the Fan 50 Plus Pins board. Um, you could go to our website, click on our Amazon uh, affiliate link and, and, and get the board that way. Thank you very much to do that. Um, we get like two to three percent or whatever. You don't call, you don't pay more. So those DSI boards, um, if I were to go into my service trailer and open up a cabinet, you're going to see a UIB 64. I've probably got five or six of those UIB 64 boards for all the water heaters. Uh, I'm going to have fan 50 plus pins. I've got a UIBS, a UIBL. All these different UIB boards are like Swiss Army knives. Um, and then they make a bunch of the same boards that'll work on refrigerators as well. There's one dinosaur board will do 15 different refrigerators. So to your question, yes, the exact same, uh, I'm going to say with dinosaur, um, board, uh, the fan 50 plus pins board will work on all your suburbans and all your, uh, Dometics, um, and your Atwoods. Um, there may be a, a one or two that's weird, but overwhelmingly all the boards are interchangeable. Jim says, how does the remote ohm sender on my unit mounted LP tank work? So how does the remote ohm sender on my unit mounted LP tank work? Mine appears to be a plastic gauge with two wires attached to the tank. Okay, a MSE tank or a DOT cylinder? Good question. So, um, Jim, if you want to let us know, I'll look in the comments. And see. Yeah, if, if, it's, if it's an AMSE tank, this would be on your class A, class B, class C. Um, it's going to be a little gauge with two wires ticking out of it. Um, there's an actual float inside your tank, kind of like you might find in the butt in your toilet. Okay. And then the, so that is a little red needle that's moving. And then there's a little black sticky thing that they stick onto that clear glass thing. And that's picking up that little red needle. And it's, it's basically seeing the needle move and changing the resistance value in the wire that's going to your, um, your, your, your indicator your monitor panel uh, some of those are adjustable you'll have to read the instructions um, so that is to say that um, um, if the tank is actually empty and it's still showing that there's still some in there you can adjust some of those um, in the settings um, in the settings of the monitor panel now there's there's C level uh, there's some really simple ones uh, there's different manufacturers that make the the monitor panel so just get with your um, um, instructions is what I'm thinking of and um, see how to adjust those. But uh, it's basically just moving a wiper inside of this little black gauge and it's changing the resistance in the wire. And that's what the monitor panel sees. And the red gauge is that a float it's physically floating on top of the liquid. I don't know if it's going to help you or if you already answered this because I haven't really been listening, but okay. he has AMSC AMS tank. Okay. So yeah, the tank itself is going to have a float. The little black thing that's stuck on the lens is basically changing resistance as it follows that little red needle inside that clear lens. All right. Ken <clears throat> says, I think my deep cycle batteries under my slide out are bad. I checked the voltage at the batteries while it was plugged into AC and also when the RV is running. Both times it was 7.6 volts. Ooh, 7.6 volts. Okay. So wait, uh, scan through that one real quick. Okay. So this is the deep cycle battery. Mm -hmm. And then you said the RV was running. So wait, read that again. Let me just, I'm looking, I'm listening for something specific here. I think my deep cycle batteries under my slide out are bad. Okay. I checked the voltage at the batteries yes. while it was plugged into AC. And also okay. when the RV was running. Okay, we're good. Um, so that sounds like it might be a converter is not producing voltage. Um, if you're plugged into AC, you should be getting at least 13.6 volts at those batteries. Now, if you have deep cycle batteries, plural batteries, to check those properly, you need to disconnect the, um, like they're all either series or parallel connected. Um, let's check each battery individually, okay? If you have two batteries and they're both connected together, and you, you, what are you testing? You're not testing the batteries, you're testing the whole circuit. So it's good to take the two batteries, to, to take the leads off and test this battery and then test this battery totally separate from each other. Um, but if you're getting seven volts, that would tell me that either your converter is bad um, or that your converter is, is not working, um, that your converter is not working. Um, there are fuses on your converter itself um, or, um, yeah, so I don't suspect the battery just yet. I suspect it's the converter. And so I would look at it, the converter. We've got a playlist on our YouTube for um, 
uh, converters and different ways to test those. Um, so I don't think it's your batteries right now. It might be, but um, the converter should be given at 13.6 ballpark. Okay. C. Arc says, have you seen issues with Keystone back wall fiberglass bowing out on exterior? Um, not just Keystone. Uh, that has to do with the rear cap not being sealed. Um, uh, I get a lot of questions regarding, well, who makes better RVs and all this kind of stuff. And it's really, the RV manufacturers are doing a great job. Um, and so it's not like that, that Keystone or, or Jayco or Winnebago or any of um, if, if water can get into that, um, what is it, a vacuum bonded sandwich thing, um, it's going to delaminate. It doesn't matter whose RV it is. Um, but uh, some do it better than others. But um, usually roofs and seals is not something that's going to be covered by warranty. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen an RV manufacturer honor a warranty for uh, maybe a rare situation delamination when it's brand new. But um, I don't know that that's unique to Keystone is my point. Um, I would say that it, it water somehow is getting in there, usually from the rear cap or the front cap. Uh, we see this more on the rear cap where um, how they attach the rear cap and how the rubber roof goes underneath it is not sealed. Water gets in there and it, it starts to delaminate um, the fiberglass from the uh, styrofoam from the Luan on the inside. Okay. How are we doing? I'm doing great. Okay, okay. Like I said, I'm just trying to get as many questions as we can. Stacy says hot water heater and zone one furnace stopped working after a few cycles. Hot water heater. Okay, so water heater, not hot water heater. Okay. And uh, so water heater and zone one furnace stopped working at the same time? Stop working after a few cycles. After a few cycles. Uh, when they stop working, does that mean that they've lost power or they are not? So one's a furnace. If you're saying zone one, unless this is an aqua yeah, hot. Zone one furnace. Zone one furnace and water heater. Uh both stop working after. So what does that have in common? My is this on a RV that has like a multiplex system where um uh or is it like you flip a switch kind of a thing? So I'd be curious if this is a multiplex type of an RV, you would have Intellitech, um, um uh starts with an S silver leaf uh, uh it would be it would we would take the troubleshooting one way if it was a multiplex system we would take it another way if these are just individual switches um if your furnace zone one stops working i would be curious if your thermostat is one of these dometic 12 button controls if it is so if it's a zone furnace it could be a coleman thermostat or a dometic thermostat i would be curious about that i would want to look at the uh voltage going to the furnace um and the water heater after a couple cycles we can um, go to the next one and if um, stacy if you want to give a little bit more detail we can try to circle back and answer that yeah i i I'm, I'm sure i could help figure that out but I, I need more information on on what does that mean that it stops working uh does power go away or does it just not make hot water anymore and does a furnace not turn on um as a tech, I would want to follow the trail. I'd want to follow the voltage. Was the furnace getting the proper voltage and not working? Is the water heater getting voltage through the thermostat and not working, et cetera? So I need more information on that. Okay. All righty. Um, so Chris says, hello from Austin, Texas. Hey, we were just hey, in Austin. I took my mom down there yeah. to visit some family. Um, One of my customer favorite restaurants is down has there. a couple soft spots in the roof of Ooh. the RV. Is okay. this repairable and do you have a video? Uh, yes, it's repairable. It's very expensive. No, I don't have a video. Um, if uh, you want to get yourself up to Wichita Falls, Texas, I'll give a shout out to a very dear friend. Um, it's uh, RVEMT. His name's Kyle Woodward and Donnie Pullen. Uh, they, if you want to get up to Wichita Falls, since you're down there, they are absolute experts on roofs. So basically that soft spot, you're going to have to pull all the rubber roof off. You're going to have to pull all the decking, put new decking down, and then put new glue down, put new roof down, and new rubber down. Okay. 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 Yeah. If it's got a customer, then reach out to um, um, the, I would defer roof questions to Kyle Woodward at RVEMT. I think he's got a Facebook or something like that. Um, now all of a sudden a thousand people are going to bombard. I'm like, ah! <laughs> shame on you, Kyle. Love you, brother. 
but uh, Kyle and I, we started, I, um, I we learned how to do a lot of my work because of Kyle. So, and Donnie was one of my first bosses when I started this trade at $13 an hour as an RV tech. <laughs> so uh, Kyle and Donnie in Wichita Falls um, would be the people that I feel very comfortable referring people to for roof work. Uh, roof questions and things like that. I have no idea if they're going to answer yet, <laughs> but um, every time I've ever had a question on roofs, uh, and and Kyle and I have done a couple roof jobs together, and I'll tell you, it's a young man's job, but um, it is repairable, it is expensive, and it's not something you're just going to patch repair unless Kyle's got some tips and tricks that he could share with you. Okay, um, Cirrus <clears throat> 820 Travelers says, I love your channel and viewing all the content. We have a 2013 Montana 3150 RL and experiencing LCI landing gear issue, okay. controller fixed problem, pressing the buttons or tabs on bad units are non-functioning. Okay, those LCI units, I guess this is a Lippert electronic control. Um, not even a month ago, we or maybe, maybe it was a little bit longer, we were working on a customer that had a similar type of a situation. It was in Forks, Washington, and it turns out that their controller, that little touchscreen, that that was bad. And so the way we proved that is it's really kind of simple. Don't be intimidated by this, but I, I made a little simple, simple jumper, okay? And I became the control board. And that is to say, you've got your solenoids that are gonna go up and down, so find your manifold and then you're going to have some solenoids on there the blue one is going to be your pressure valve so you ignore him but one's going to um, uh, energize out and back and so i made jumper wires and um hey here's a plug for my uh, you have a tap kit anyway we another tool that i make is a test lead set it's this red and black wire thing trisha's running as we'll get one and uh, so using that exact kit um i use that on almost every job every day it's so much fun it's like Darwin's theory of, of tool evolution. I've just really put a lot into this little test lead set. So using that test lead set, um, I created, uh, so uh, it's in here. Okay. So, um, okay. Let me open this real quick. So basically it's this little thing right here. It's kind of got a shiny thing to it. I use stacking banana plugs. But um, anyway, go to my website and you'll see more information on it. And, and then um, I would use some of these to tap into the, the wires on it. And um, here, I'll put this away in a minute. So anyway, look at those solenoids. Um, you're going to see a thing called a trombetta. The trombetta, I believe it's a green and a yellow wire. Don't make me a liar, but it's this big thing where the big battery wire comes to. And then there's two other battery wires here. And these two battery wires go to the motor. And then there's these little bitty wires that control that. So using that test lead, you're able to energize the pump. OK, it won't be energized from the control panel because we're assuming that that's bad. But this is how you're going to prove. Is it the control panel or is it the control module? Or is it the pump? What what is the problem? Using that test lead there, um, you then become the, the the control module, and you're tapped into the wires, and you're going to give it 12 volts to energize, reverse or clockwise, counterclockwise, to get the pump to run, and then you're going to energize your different solenoids to make the the pump the, the jacks go down, the jacks come up, the front jacks go down, the front jacks come up. That's exactly what we did on the customer and forks, and it turns out that um, everything works fine. It's just the control panel was bad. We found one on Amazon. It was like, I don't even remember what the price was, but we found one. And um, I basically told them, order this one and plug it in. And I haven't heard back. So I'm assuming that that worked. So a little bit longer answer, but I think that would, that's what I would do if I was there. I'm not sure if it helps, but he says, yes, sir, did that. Not sure exactly what he's referring to, but like jumping starter solenoid, yep. have two to Oh, have to send you to disassemble if you want. Oh, yes, I don't want. I, um, I, I used to throw all the parts away because I'm not going to resell any part that's used, but I'm in collecting them for show and tell. And if you've watched some of our Q&A videos, I'll have a couple furnaces and, and things like that that I'm starting to do for show and tell. So um, I don't want to be overwhelmed with stuff, but there's some cool things that we could use for show and tell that are broken. And um, one of the things I'll be doing soon is taking a furnace... Um, uh, heat exchanger. In fact, it's the one that we just did a video on. And um, I'm going to be cutting that in half to show you what's inside the heat exchanger. I figured that'd be kind of an exciting thing. And um, some more slice and dice type stuff. So okay. Randall says, Dometic refrigerators keep cutting off after resetting button. Cycles okay. for 30 minutes and cuts off. Heater unit heats up on outside. What gives? 
Okay, um, you're not gonna like the answer more than, okay, there's, there's two ways to look at this one. The first way is those switches. Now I'm assuming when you're saying it cuts off, are you talking about that little reset button right on the heater stack, the boiler stack? Two little red wires go to this little thing and you'll push a button in. Is that what he's talking about? Because that that would cause it to reset. He said Dometic refrigerator, right? Mm, yes. Dometic. I'm thinking that's what you're talking about. On the boiler stack, you got this little two red wires go to it. You push a little button in. Um, those go bad. It's like an $18 part. So it could be that. They do go bad. Um, I stock a few. Um, but if it keeps tripping, then you it's an indication that you might have a blockage in your cooling unit, or you may have a leaker in your cooling unit. Um, typically, if it's getting too hot, then it might be the evidence of a leaker because you've lost the hydrogen out and your ammonia is just boiling itself to death. If you are able to get your refrigerator to continue to work, I know it's tripping out, but if you're able to get it to work for like an hour or so, um, I want you to feel the temperature of the boiler and feel the temperature of those windy, windy, wind coils or the absorber coils, the, the ammonia vapors going up and the hot water is coming down and the ammonia is absorbed into the water as it's working its way down. It's pretty cool. Did a whole video on how heat makes cold. Um, and I might do another one on that because um, I think I could probably condense that down a little bit more. Anyway, <clears throat> if you have good circulation through your whole cooling unit, then the temperature between the boiler and the absorber should be very similar. There's actually a 10 degree difference between the two if it's if it's a healthy refrigerator. Um, so the question then becomes, if your little reset is tripping, then I'm assuming this is getting really hot and this never gets hot. Mm -hmm. And if this boiler gets hot and the, the absorber never gets hot, that is textbook blockage. What causes blockage? I've done a video on that. It's the one where I've got orange gloves on and um, uh, it's an ice dam. It's the ice dam refrigerator. Um, and, um, I talk a little bit about blockages, what causes them and, um, um, the whole thing of turning the refrigerator upside down and hitting it with a hammer. I debunk that whole, um, that myth has been around for years and years and years, but, um, um, turning it upside down and hitting it with a hammer might fix it. But anyway, in that video, I've, the, the, the thumbnail has got orange gloves on and, um, I think it's the ice dam video, but anyway, I talk about that anyway. So if you're high temperature sensor, your high temperature switch on your boiler is tripping, more than likely it's a blockage and that's not something that you can repair in the field. So. All right. Um, Patrick <clears throat> asks, roof sealant, what should be used on TPO, EPDM, and fiberglass? Okay. I am a, I, I'm not associated with any of these companies, but I'm a big fan of, uh, was it Geosil? Um, and so um, there's also Cicaflex. And um, I've even used a product called Vulcan, which is good. And of course, Dicor. Um, uh, I, I've stopped using Dicor because after a year, that stuff turns yellow and cracky, um, whereas the Geosil and the Cicoflex does not. There's also one from France. Uh, it's got a B in the name. I can't think of it. I don't have it, but I haven't tried it yet. But my usually go to the stuff I stock is Geosil. Um, I like their RV Proflex sealant for all my sealants. And um, all their roof sealants, I use that for. So to answer your TPO and your um, EPDM, um, on the um, label of the product, it'll tell you if it's good for EPDM, if it's good for TPO. Don't be surprised if some of them are good for EPDM, but not TPO. So you've got to read on there. If I, had, if I was in my shop right now, I could pull up a tube. And if I was not doing this live, I would actually hit pause and go read all the specs on the stuff and maybe even throw up the spec sheet from the manufacturer's website. Um, but off the top of my head, um, I believe the GeoSil uh, self-leveling, I, I don't want to say that it does and then it not do it, but um, uh, mostly what I come across is EPDM. The TPO uh, don't come across that too often. And of course, fiberglass roofs. But, um, but anyway, so read the label <clears throat> and... Um, Pick your your ceiling of choice. Uh, hopefully, I, I may not have answered your question, but I hope. <laughs> and any like some of the stuff that we reference when this video posts, we'll also include links. Like as much as we can, we'll put in, um, you know, documents, links to documents, links to videos, links to products, all of that. Anything that um, we reference on here. Cool. Like in the description below, like a normal video, we'll, uh, on a normal video that we publish, the description will have all these links. So once this, this is live, but once we, yeah. 
do our metadata on it, then, then we'll put the stuff down there in the description. So you could watch it again in a week or so, and then it'll have all that, all the links in there. Yeah. And I'm just going to do a little um, plug um, <laughs> and just say that there is a little button on there with a little money sign if you want to give us um, some thanks. So we really like doing the YouTube thing, and this is super fun, and we'll do it for free. But um, it'd be really cool if you want to hit that little thanks button and give us a little um, donation. That, oh, uh, and the 10000 or uh, what is it, 100000 Oh, yeah. yeah, we can. We'll do that at the end of the video. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Um, We're so close to 100,000. <laughs> so, okay. Um, smooth. I think, I don't know. Maybe I miscopied that. But I want to remove carpet in bedroom to put linoleum. Any problem with using current rollers? Current rollers. Oh, um, no, they do have a product called a slicker. Um, you can get them in uh, a lot of your RV um uh, go to any RV parts store and just get a big catalog. It's usually put out by NTP. It's going to have the, the, the company's picture on the front. Um, but if you flip through there, there's a product called a slicker. Okay. So if you take your carpet out and you put down linoleum, then you would put the slicker down and that's where the rollers will roll. And that way it doesn't eat into your linoleum. Okay. Um, so slickers. There's a question there. Uh, I think this is an anonymous question. Um, valid. Okay, I'm just going to read it. Okay. Questions. Valid <clears throat> leveling system. Yep. 2016 tip and bus 37 AP. After leveling coach enters zero set mode reset, but when airbags up to travel mode, left side of coach still one inch low. Even after you set your null point. Um Valid is the name of one of the companies that makes leveling systems. Ah, thanks. It was uh, yeah, she was hung up on them like valid, valid. Yeah, they're they're um, valid makes. So even okay, so you've set your null point, and you do an auto level, and it's still off a little bit, um, and so your leveling system. Um, so you've got uh, so it's gonna what let the air out of the bags first and then it's going to jack itself up on the leveling on the hydraulic jacks if I, I haven't worked on one of these in a while i'm trying to remember and after it does all that it's still off by as they say in texas an inch um or a little bit uh i would love to be there because what i would look for is the signals going to the different um I would want to verify your null point uh, if darren was there i trust you i love you but i would still darren would want to verify and I'd want to see it work. What is telling it that it's not level? It's it's really not a complicated system. There's a lot of things going on, but um, I'm wondering why it it doesn't think it's level after you've set the null point. Um, that would be very curious to me. If everything else is working just fine, I'm I'd really like to dig into that whole question on why is that zero point null point? Different trades call it different things. The level where everything's level so to do that you 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 know this but i'll just share it for other people um you put your system into manual mode you get a floor level and you put on the thing and then you manually human level it until you know that it's right and i think different manufacturers have so many different ways to do this but there's like this secret button you have to push three times five times ten times hold for three seconds hold for five seconds different manufacturers it's impossible to keep all this in your head so i go around little cheat sheets and um then you you say oh you, you tell the system this is level this is perfectly level and then it turns itself on turns itself back on now it knows what level is and then you drive around a little bit and you push a button and it should bring it back to what it thinks level is um but if yours is consistently always off I, is there something wrong with the with the null sensor um that's a that's a fun one I, that would be fun to play with, but I, I need more information. I and what more information I would need is I would want to actually get my sensors on uh, my my meter on some different uh, uh, circuits and and read the current going through all the different things. Why does it think it's not level? Um, if everything else is working fine and it doesn't think it's level, maybe the null the null sensor is bad. And just a thought. I don't know. I would I would really dive into that part of it. <clears throat> Um, and just to just to clarify that if you send us more information, unless we've already said that we'll answer it, we probably won't be able to. So we're just, very busy. <laughs> um, I love all this stuff, but yeah, we're 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 very busy with so much going on that I I would love. That's why we do the live streams. 
and the Q and A's. It's the only opportunity we can to kind of sew in and answer a lot of these questions. But yeah, we. Um, yeah. Okay. So CB99, what is your opinion of the powered titanium RV water heater anode rods versus the expendable rods? Uh, I'm an expendable rod guy, and depending on what part of the country you're in, would depend on if it's magnesium or zinc. Um, um, I don't know. The thing with the anode rod is you're supposed to service and back flush your water heater every year anyway. And so um, the only reason you would need an anode rod is if your tank is steel. So you're looking at your Suburbans. Um, their tanks are steel. I cut one in half on one of my videos, and it's got this little uh, uh, enamel liner on the inside. Um, and so if you're supposed to back flush, which is very different than draining, and I, I've done a couple of videos on draining because you could drain your water heater and just let water flow out of it. And then you're like, are we done? And then I put that little screw on piece on there and I start blasting the inside of it. All this crap's coming out of it. We weren't done, folks. And all that stuff settles into the bottom. So if you're supposed to do that to your water heater every single year, and if you're living in your RV full time, you really should do this every six months. Um, and especially if you're traveling around all over the country, um, it would be good because you're going to pick up sediment from this RV park. Um, we had to stay, I used to do airport automation jobs and we were in Miami and I, the only RV park I could find in December in Miami was in Everglades, Gator Park in the Everglades. And even to this day, my RVs, water lines are all stained. <laughs> so all that ended up in my water heater. So you've got these anode rods that last forever and ever and ever. Well, you're supposed to take it out and inspect your water heater every year anyway. And since an anode rod is only like 15 bucks, I just go with the, the kind that you just take it out, throw it away, put a new one in there while you're back flushing your water heater. That's my take um, on it. So. Okay. Um, biggest writer, at wood gas only water heater on initial fire up gets hot, but won't maintain heat after that. Won't maintain heat after, uh, won't maintain heat because it won't refire. So the water heater, okay, so the Atwood water heater gas only, it's flaming off, it's happy, everybody's going, brings itself up to temperature, and then you take a shower, wash dishes, do with something, and then the water temperature cools back down again. Does it not refire on gas? Um, or is it refiring on gas and not getting hot again? Um, if it's refiring every time, then I would look at the back of the water heater. I would look at your bypass valves to make sure that you're not in bypass mode. Okay. Cause I can't tell you how many times we've gone on jobs like this, where those valves in the back of your water heater, where you can kind of bypass a water heater, you would need to do that for a winterization, or maybe you're servicing your water heater and you, you want to keep the water going to the rest of your coach. So um, sometimes there's water going in and going out, but the bypass valve is also open. So you get warm water. So look for that. Um, if it's not refiring, now you're looking at a thermostat problem. Um, I think you're looking at a thermostat problem if it's, if it's that, but if it's hot the first time, not every other time and it's refiring, then I would look at your bypass valve on the back to make sure it's not in a bypass mode. Well, like it's allowing water in and out of the water heater and it's also bypassing at the same time. So you're getting like a blending effect. So look for that, for that water heater. All right. We've got a rear toilet has both lights lit keeps making gurgle sound won't flush um is it one of these tecma toilets it does not see okay so if you got two lights and won't flush that's a tecma toilet making gurgly sounds um with the information that you provided me i'm going to assume it's one of these toilets that has a macerator pump built into the base of it and you push like a big button or a little button if it's number one or number two and then there are sensors on your tank itself uh, these are separate from the sensors that are, go to the monitor panel. You've got your tank that has a monitor panel, and that's going to say like high, medium, or low. And then if you have this toilet that I'm thinking you have based on the information, then there's another set of sensors on the exact same tank that if the toilet wants to flush and the sensors on the tank, not the monitor panel sensors, these are the Tecma. I'm, I'm going to say Tecma, okay, but there's a couple different manufacturers that make this that are telling the little brain, I don't have enough room for what you're about to send me, then it will not allow it to flush. Now, I have seen these sensors have fallen off the tank. So basically the question then becomes, why will the toilet not allow itself to flush? And the only reason that that toilet would not flush is that the sensors are telling it that there's no room in the tank. So then go look for the sensors. Hopefully you can gain access to them. And, um, 
then try to get them to stick back on again. Um, there is, uh, if I had one with me, there's a way to trick it. Um, on some of these um, uh, manufacturers, these macerator pump toilets, there's a way to hold something. I don't remember what the combination is to, to force it to flush, like an emergency flush. So, um, but if it's not flushing overwhelmingly, it's usually the sensors, not the monitor panel sensors, but the toilet flush sensors that have um, either fallen off is what I usually find because they're just, there's these sticky things that stick onto the side of the tank. Uh, so clean that really well and put it back on. And hopefully that that's what the problem is. <clears throat> and that was from Jeff and Jeff is from Alabama, but he's visiting Port Orchard this week. Hey, so right good. Nearby. Yeah. Hi. And Welcome. I think it snowed there too, because we just drove up from uh, Tumwater and it snowed. We almost got stuck at Sid's mom's house. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, it wasn't that much snow. It's yeah, we had about two to three inches. It's just beautiful. It's like a snow globe. And then a couple of days later, it's gone. So it's been kind of fun. Uh, Sally Jean says, where can I get power to hook my side marker cameras? Um, okay, so you have side marker cameras. I need to know where power is going to come from. Um, that's it's kind of a loaded question. I would need to physically be there <clears throat> um, to figure that out. Surprisingly, sometimes um, we put these cameras on and we've got a big borrow and steel, but to, to figure out how to get power to that location. Now, if you've got, if you're only going to use these cameras, here, there's a trick, okay? And it's it has to do with your clearance lights. If you've got a marker light or a clearance light or a headlight, okay, they're going to get 12 volts. And if your camera is going to be near that location, that's fine. You could get 12 volts that way. The caveat to that is the only time your camera would work is when your headlights or your marker lights were on. Um, for some folks, that's okay because they run with their lights on all the time anyway. If you want your cameras to work when you're not driving, then you might need to run a wire, uh, find a 12 volt source somewhere and figure out how to get it to that location. Um, if you let me know what kind of RV you have, um, even, even if you told me if it was a fifth wheel or if it was a class A, B or C, um, yeah, you need to, I, I would need to physically be there and just kind of be a, a, a sleuth and kind of figure out where, where are we going to get a 12 volt power source from? Maybe there's a light somewhere, um, that you could tap off of a light or a ceiling fan, you know, those little vent things. Um, a propane alarm would be another place that's got 12 volts down low. Um, these types of things, um, a power seat for your elect for your power seats if you have power seats you can get 12 volts from those so electric window door locks things like that so here's um from rodney and he has a question um so it sounds like he is looking at maybe becoming a technician or maybe yes. he's already a technician and just okay. thinking about getting certified um so he says do you think the nrva is good or should you go to the manufacturer classes um, I, I have not been to, um, NRVTA. I mean, I, I, I know Terry and Steve, I would consider them great friends. I'm just not a graduate of, of the school there. Um, now when I got started originally in this, Terry had put out some CDs, um, um, take home RV tech course. So I'm a graduate of that, <laughs> but that goes back to like 2010 and the NRVTA was, was a, a, a dream. And I'm so excited that they pulled that off. Um, me personally, um, so not having been to any formal schools, I got my training for two years working at a dealership for $13.80 an hour. Um, and I worked at a dealership, didn't make a lot of money. I think the most you'll make at a dealership is maybe 50 grand. But um, I work at the dealership specifically to learn how these RVs work, how they fail and how to fix them. Uh, my goal going into that was always to start my mobile RV service business. So it wasn't so much about the 1387. They were set, they were paying me. Um, I would never work for that and support a family, but there was a dream involved in that. And uh, to more about that, uh, you go to our website, go to the About Us page on the bottom. I was interviewed by Greg Gerber and that interview goes into a little bit more. So there are the, so when I went, when I started this back in 2010, 2011 timeframe after being an engineer for 30 years, um, I don't know that there was any schools. I think there was one in Florida, um, but now there's a much larger option. So um, that wasn't really an option that I took. I did take Terry's CD courses. They were fantastic. And that's what got me started and planted the seed. Um, I have been to a lot of manufacturers trainings. Um, in, in our area, there's a lot of RV dealerships down in the Tacoma, Seattle area, right there in Fife, where the, 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 twin, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge is 
that fell back in the 60s. You go across those. Um, and uh, every once in a while, I'll hear about a training course at one of those dealerships and I'll call and ask, hey, can I can I sit in on this? Most of those are, are for that RV dealerships technicians, the manufacturer will come in. Um, so I've been to um, quite a few of those. And um, Dometic has a DATA, Dometic Advanced Training Academy. Uh, that one you got to pay a couple hundred dollars for. It's like four days long. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic training. That's one where they'll set up in a hotel. I've also been to the Lippert. I'm a plank owner. Uh, Lippert has a uh, training facility, I think is in Goshen. Um, when we had our class there, it was like a four day class. That one's free, but you got to pay for your hotel and your food, uh, the paint was still wet on the walls. We were the very first class that walked in there. They, they have it in where I believe where the uh, H1 Hummer was, was built back in the day. So I've been to a lot of uh, manufacturers training, manufacturer rep training, uh, been to a lot of dealerships, did a lot of RV tours uh, at the factories where they build these things. Um, but I have not formally sat in on any of the um, the classes in Florida, the classes in Athens. Um, haven't been to any of those trainings at all. Um, and um, honestly, a lot of and here, I'll just finish up my story on this because I know there's a couple, probably a couple other RV techs out there. Um, I think one of the things that really pushed me to learn this product was when I worked at a dealership for my 1387 an hour. Um, I think they paid me 17 eventually. Okay. So I didn't go there for the money. One of the things I did was a lot of the PDIs, the pre-delivery inspections where the, RV, the, the sales guy would sell the RV. It comes to my bay. I'm supposed to get it ready. And then I would be the one that would do the walkthrough. And this was in Texas. And um, there's a lot of money in Texas. And a lot of these rich guys would buy these RVs and um, I'd be showing them around their $300,000 RV and they'd ask me a question. What's that? What's this do? How does this work? I did not know the answer. And um, there was one particular guy, I'll never forget him. He's like, well, I'm not pulling out of this thing until you explain to me how that works. I'll be back tomorrow. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm not paying me to care. So I actually started reading the manuals at that point. And um, I read so many manuals on all these systems. And um, that's how I got to know so much of this information, the little intricate detail stuff from read the manuals. So read your manuals and on our website, uh, a lot of the manuals that I've read, I put on our website. So on our website, on the resources tab, you have the manuals section. These are service manuals. I don't have a lot of owner's manuals. I have service manuals. And so I've read a lot of those cover to cover. So um, you can go to the training and you can go to the classes. And even after you graduate, never stop learning. Always seek out because even as a certified tech, you always have to have continuing education credit. So you always have to be seeking out and going to more classes. And there's a, we'll make a link. I don't know what it is offhand, but down in the description after we publish this, um, there's a, if I can find it, I hope it's still active, but um, there was a link I used to click on and it would tell me where all the courses are throughout the year. And maybe my wife and I, kids might plan a vacation around going to that place and, and taking a course there. Uh, we did that down in Portland uh, a couple of years back before COVID. So anyway, long answer to your question, but I'm passionate about it because we do need more RV technicians. And um, uh, I think, I don't know how many millions of RVs are out there, but we need not just RV technicians, but we need really good RV technicians, ones that really understand and really have a passion and a care to get it right. And that's one of the reasons we started our video, to get it right. There's a lot of BS information out there that's just flat out wrong on these people. And they're you're buying your RVs and it just really gets me when the information out there is wrong. So we, we want to set the record straight and I'm getting the information directly from manuals. So you can read a bunch of manuals. You can work for 1387 an hour like I did. If your dream's big enough, it doesn't matter. Um, and um, um, so anyway, I'll, I'll land my plane with all of that. But um, yeah, you could go to the training courses. You can go to the schools. But um, on a side note, I'll even mention this. I'm not going to mention names or anything. But we did hire a, a certified RV technician, brand new certified technician. And um, uh, I would call him a friend. But um, when we started working on some of these projects, some of these RVs, um, even his certification was, 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 was really not worth anything. I need skilled experience. That's what I needed. Not some piece of paper that says you went to school for so much time and you spent so much money to get this piece of paper. Uh, honestly, that doesn't mean anything to me. I want to know, can you understand my problem, theory of operation, sequence of events? Can you fix that? That's all I care about, not what school you went to. So, okay, enough on that. I'm gonna get off my soapbox. So long answer, but I'm passionate about that topic right there. So. Um, okay. Done. Uh, so let me see. I 
think we actually need to wrap it up um, because we're going to do oh, okay. a drawing. Um, and I think we should just go ahead and do that now. We've what got all of our names, right? And Darren, Darren, yeah. Just okay, okay. okay. <laughs> and then Darren uh, can draw a okay. name. And then I think what we'll do, we'll announce the winner. And if you're comfortable, if you will leave us your email address. Um, if not, when this video posts, if you can just um, make a comment, uh, we'll reach out to you and, and go from there so we can make sure to get this to you. But um, yeah, go ahead and draw. On you your want to explain how they ended up in here? Oh, everybody that has put their um, location in the comment section has been entered in there. Okay. And I've right. been writing them all down. And so. Do you want me to draw or you want to draw? Yeah. No, I think you should. Okay, here we go. So, what are they going to win? They're going to win. Uh, a gift basket with our merch. Okay. Yeah. So what you're going to win is... And I think we might throw in an e-gift card to our store, but we'll see. A hat that you've seen me wear, a t-shirt, and a tumbler that's got the Meyer Works logo on it. And, and we'll probably... I'll probably send a large shirt and a large hat, the ones that fit the most people, but um, we can work out the details and get you exactly what you need if you, you know, work, go back and forth with us. I hate this part. Okay. Wait, hold on, I got one more. Oh, we got one more. We got one more. Okay. Okay. All right. Hold on. Okay. Anne is writing down. So, TNT. I don't know if you're uh, subscribed to us over on Patreon, uh, but we are going to go over there for a half an hour from 5.30 to 6 and answer more questions. We'll post the link to that. Okay. Um, and if not, we'll be doing these monthly. So... All right, we got to quote. Okay. Are, are, done right. Are you saying we're fat? <laughs> I just, to be honest, I just based that off of Darren's size. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm an extra large guy. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach in. Here we go. I hate this part. Okay, I got my finger on this one right here. I'm gonna I'm gonna um here. Can you read? Oh, Anne's gonna read that one. Jim Narlock, Sumner, Sumner, oh, Sumner, Washington, nice. Sumner, yay. Okay, right. well, Jim, oh, Jim, you are the you, one that was drawn from here. If you're comfortable putting your email in the comments right now, then I'll, I'll contact you and we'll get that all taken care of. If not, then once this posts um, if in the comments, if you can just, you know, just make some comment, hi, I'm the winner or something like that, I'll see your handle and be able to. And info um, at Myrby works, works as well. Yeah. yeah, you could do that as well. Um, well, congratulations, Jim. So I, I did want to kind of just say we'll probably um, be doing like a formal announcement, but um, we're looking forward to the upcoming year. And with these live streams, we've kind of felt like um, that answering your questions is better in this format. So for the upcoming year, we're going to go um, back to repair videos, more repair style videos, I think. We've That's kind fine. of talked about that. Um and then do a monthly uh, monthly live streams. So we'll we'll do a formal announcement on exactly what that will look like. But we're looking forward to um, some exciting things in the new year. And we also are very close to 100,000 subscribers. So please please subscribe. <laughs> it's and, our goal. <laughs> yeah, and we also just well, it would be really cool if somehow we could do that by the end of the year. That would be really cool if we could get to a hundred thousand subscribers. So if you know share it somebody, with your friends. yeah, share it with your friends. Uh, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe, and then feel free to let us know. Um, yeah, if you have any ideas, what should we do to celebrate once we get a hundred thousand subscribers? What should, should we, we do? do? Another drawing like this? Should yeah. we do a live stream? Uh, just let us know. So. Good. And thank you all. This is so cool. And it's so fun to get to interact with everybody. I know Ann and I are off camera. Someday, right maybe, someday maybe we'll be on camera, but yeah. it's just so cool to be able to interact with everybody and um, to be able to like answer questions and get to know you all. And yeah, this is really turn fun. The camera. <laughs> I would get slapped. <laughs> but, oh, I don't mind, but well, maybe a little. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I shaved a little bit today. So did my um, hair okay? Oh, I don't have my hat. Here. Oh, you want to put a link to Patreon? Um, so yeah, what we're gonna do now is um, um, at what? How, how soon are we gonna? Okay, so if I think if, as soon as we get done here, we're gonna hop on. Gonna, It'll probably take us a couple minutes, but if um, okay. you use the link to go over to our Patreon site, um, if you are a patron, you'll have access to that live stream. It should just be. It should show up in your feed at the top. Okay. 
um, and you can log in um, there too. So yeah, so, so we'll we'll see you on Patreon for those of you that are Patreon. We'll we'll go a little bit longer on our overtime session. I think we're blocking about a half an hour to answer more questions. Yeah. Um, what would be helpful for me and the ladies could let me know. I went a little bit faster this time than my first. There's only a second uh, live stream um, because I realized I wasn't able to get to everybody's question last time, and I wanted to go a little bit faster this time to maybe get more questions in. So uh, give me some critiques back. Like, was the pace good? Um, could I have spent more time, less time? These types of things, because I really want to make it better for you guys. If you're going to spend your time, your afternoon, your evening, wherever you guys are located, um, I want to make sure it's worth your time, and I can get the right information to you. So let me know how I can be better. So, and thanks to, so Sierra says, enjoy him working with his son too. So pretty cute. Got Dakota on there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Videos. He was going to be here to do the drawing, but um, we're, at, we're at Trisha and Sid's home. Um, Trisha runs the office and Sid does all the video editing. You want to say hi, Sid? Hello. There's Sid. <laughs> and... Um, so uh, two two great couples. We get along really well. And um, so Sid and Trisha, Sid's running the office and Sid does the videos. And Ann and I, we run I'm the other the, the, the field side of it. And then Dakota, my son, he tags along with me on some of my jobs. And he's been in quite a few of my videos. But um, yeah, if we were going to be doing this at our place, but we're snow and um, we just had the, the bug or something go through there. So we decided to not do it over there. We don't want Sid and Trisha to be exposed to that. So, um, so Sirius, yeah, you could certainly send us your thoughts um, by email. I mean, you're, you can feel free to post them here. We, yeah. We're not offended or hurt I, if you have some feedback for us. We just mm -hmm. want to make it better. So, um, and I, well, we have a few more minutes. I'm a Marine, so you, you got to be careful. My feelings get hurt. I'm real sensitive. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> So let me, I actually found one. Oh, we got a question. Jump ahead because I wonder, okay, I'm going to try to find it. I feel it. like we're family. Is a diesel <laughs> furnace, is that automatically an aqua hot or not necessarily? Uh, if you said diesel, it could be aqua hot or Oasis. Okay. I don't think I'm going to be able to. Um, a hydronic heater. Um, uh, Trisha's looking for a, a question about a diesel yeah, I'm not going to be able to. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, oh I did. Oh. She found it. Okay. What do we got? Have any experience with a diesel hot water heater? Also, any recommendations on RV washer dryer for clothes? Uh, Splendid washer dryer. Uh, go, just go to Splendid. Um, uh, S P L E N D I D E. It's an Italian one. They're made specifically for RVs. So your dryer is 120 volt and your washer is 120 volt. Um, washers are like 85 pounds. Ugh. Um, uh, on the, uh, you said a diesel water heater. The only thing that comes to mind would be a hydronic system, which would be your aqua hot or your ITR product, which is an oasis or a hurricane. Um, and yes, I have extensive experience with aqua hot and with ITR oasis. Um, so I would need a specific question and going back to one of the questions. I mean, I've even gone to the, um, aqua hot training class. I think it's three days long in, um, Centennial, Colorado near Longmont area. Um, yeah, so everywhere um, I find an opportunity, I'm going to I'm gonna go there. And um, I took a course not too long ago. Yeah, it was before COVID, so it seems like it was this yesterday. But on um, LP alarm systems, I'm like, why do I need to know these little LP alarm systems? Man, I learned so much from those things. Wow. So, um, yeah, I'm going to I'm a I'm a nerd, man. I'm going to just suck up all kinds of knowledge. Um, I, I guess I like how things work. Like I said, I was an engineer for 30 years. And the only reason I was an engineer was because I was curious how things work. So now I'm curious how RVs work. And um, stay tuned over the next little bit of time. We're going to be coming out with some really cool. Um, I'm, I'm promising not to say too much, but we're going to come up with some really cool systems where I'm going to take my, my engineering passions and time into my knowledge of how RVs work and we're going to mesh them together. It's going to be so exciting, but I'm like a horse being pulled back. Whoa, we're down there. So, um, anyway, we're, we're working on that and I'm very excited about it, but I'm not going to say anything, but since we're family, I can mention it to you guys and keep it a secret. Okay. So we're going to, um, go back to, we were talking a little bit about EPM and some sealants and things yep. like that. Okay. And we had a couple questions. So one, what about flex tape? Okay, Flex. Now, in the previous um, live stream, we talked about Flex Seal, which is that paint product. Uh, there's a Turnabond 
which is a tape. Huge fan of a turnabond, but the thing with the turnabond, and we'll make a link when this gets published, the thing with a turnabond, a lot of people do not put that on properly. Um, a turnabond, you can't just peel the thing back and stick it on there. You need to make sure your your whatever you're sticking it to is clean. Okay, uh, there's a product that is a primer. It's called Eterna Prime, and you spray that down there first, and then you put your tape on it. Peel the clear plastic piece off, put that on there. You get a J roller. It's activated by pressure, and then you're going to put that on there. That's the way you put a turnabond on. And then if you really want to get groovy, you could take some of this sealant and seal around the edges. Um, once you do that, that tape's not coming off. You'll rip your roof before you pull the tape off. Um, for those of you who just kind of wipe the stuff down and put the turnabond down, it's not going to last. Uh, it's going to stick in some spots, not in others, and you're still going to get water ingress. So if you're going to put the turnabond down, it's kind of like a commitment. You're not getting it back off easily, if at all. Um, so if you're going to do a turnabond, let's make sure we do it right. You got to buy the tape, the primer. They even have a product called Eterna Clean. Um, but you could use some other cleaners to just make sure that what you're sticking it to is good. Hey, if, if do it right, or it's not like you can peel it off and do it again. So a turnabond is some really aggressive stuff. I love it. And there's skinnies and wide. So, um, um, and then, okay, 30 seconds or less. 30 seconds, go. <laughs> uh, does GeoCell make a lock sealant? Yes, they do. Great. Um, Self-leveling and non-self-leveling. And if that's it, I think we're going to end. I'll put links for the GeoCell. And um, and hop over on Patreon. It'll take us a couple minutes. But... Okay, so um, thanks, guys. Merry Christmas. If we don't talk to you again, um, there's a reason for the season. And... Um, we're celebrating the birth of our savior. So can I say that? Yes. I just did. Too bad. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so it's birthday and um, you know where we stand. And uh, so we're going to end um, our YouTube side. Thank you for everybody for joining us. Congratulations. What was this, Jim, for our drawing? I'm looking forward to doing more of those. It's kind of exciting. And um, so we're going to end here. Thanks for everybody. Merry Christmas. Uh, make sure you spend time with your families. Stay warm. And we're going to jump over on the Patreon site now. And we're going to... Um, pick up where we left off with answering more questions and uh, I'm having fun doing this. Hope you guys are enjoying me um, and the ladies and give us some critiques on how we can make it better because we're doing this for you. Um, I could be watching hockey right now. So <laughs> go Kraken. All right. Kraken is going to win. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think I'm going to sign off now. Okay. I'm going to end the stream. Bye guys. Until next time. Okay.